Hey everyone, welcome to Virtual History 360. What if I told you we all make mistakes, and sometimes we need a take two? Hi everyone, welcome to Virtual History 360. I'm Mr. Wade, and today I'm in Geneva, Florida. Now, if you've been subscribed for a while or if you've gone through my old 360 videos, you've recognized this place. I've been here before. But I've learned some new techniques and I kind of wanted to redo this video because it wasn't quite up to what I would expect. So this is the grave of Lewis Powell's head, take two. Okay? So, like I said, I'm in Geneva, Florida. This is just north of Oviedo, just north of Orlando, kind of central Florida. Okay? Now, why am I here? I'm talking about Lewis Powell. Civil War history in Florida, of all places, kind of crazy. But hear me out. Talking about Lewis Powell, he was born in Alabama in 1844, but his family then moved to Live Oak, Florida, which is the whole like panhandle corner between Tallahassee and Gainesville, right? Give you an idea. Then when he was a teenager, you know, the Civil War breaks out and he joins the 2nd Florida Regiment. Well, he goes to numerous battles. He actually fights at Gettysburg where he's wounded in the hand. He's captured and sent to Baltimore to recover. There, he uses wiles and his just charisma to talk a nurse into giving him a Union uniform, and he escapes. That's pretty cool, don't you think? Well, after escaping, he can't rejoin his regiment, so he joins Colonel Mosby's Rangers. And boy, he took off there. He really fit in. He was a big guy. He could really do what Colonel Mosby needed him to do. Well, he serves his time. He gets out, and that's when he meets a man named John Wilkes Booth. You know that name, yes? Well... Booth had this plan. Now, you might be thinking assassination, but his first plan was actually to kidnap the president. So, Booth, Atzerat, Pound, his whole gang, they lie by a road one night waiting for the president's carriage that never comes by. That plan failed. Well, after Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, Booth had a new plan to assassinate. So, he gets his gang together, you know, starts in Surrattsville, plans it out. He says, I'm going to kill the president because Booth, you know, being the showman, wanted that notoriety. He says, Atzerat, you kill Vice President Johnson. He looks at Powell and says, you kill Secretary of State William Seward. So on the night of the 14th, Powell goes to uh, Seward's house. Well, it's easy to get to him because he's injured. He's on bed rest. He was in a carriage accident the week before. So he knocks on the door late at night and he says, hey, I have medicine to deliver. And they go, this is a little suspicious, but okay, it must be real. The doctor sent something. He manages to get all the way up to the third floor and then the questions become a little more scrutinous. There he just uses his brute strength, bursts into Seward's bedroom, jumps onto him, holds him down with his left hand, uses his right hand and his large knife to slash at him. He thinks he's done the job and then runs away. Seward actually survived. He was disfigured, and if you take a look at this picture here, you know, he, this is the only picture I could find of him after the attack. He wasn't very pleased with his look, but he did survive. But Lewis Powell goes on the run, and he's hiding for a few days. He actually thinks he's getting away with it, but he makes the mistake of going back to Surrattsville, to Mary Surratt's Tavern. That's when the Federals capture him, okay? They put him on trial, which is kind of a joke. It was the military tribunal. Find him guilty, obviously, that we know now. And he is executed on July 7th, 1865. They bury him at the fort right outside of Washington, and you would think that would be the end of his story. But over time, that fort closed. They had to exhume all the bodies, rebury them. This happens multiple times to the point where they kind of lose track of him. Record keeping's not as good as it is today, I guess. Well, he goes and gets lost. Now fast forward to 1989. A researcher at the Smithsonian is going through a uh, closet full of old bones and looking for Native American bones, and in that section, he finds a skull that doesn't look quite right. It has a lot of European features rather than Native features, and it's tagged Lewis Powell. Well, they're able to identify that it was actually him because when he was a child, he was kicked by a mule, and his jaw was broken but never actually set properly. Take a look at this picture here. You can kind of see it's misshapen. Well, using that, they identified the skull as Lewis Powell. Now, what to do with it? Well, this is where we get back to Geneva. You see, his family, after the assassination, obviously had a little bit of stigma over their heads, so they moved further south to the central Florida area to kind of get away from it all. And his descendants still live in this area today. So his great-great-great-grandniece, I believe, don't quote me on the number there, when she found out that they discovered a skull that had been lost for years, petitioned to have it sent back home to be buried next to his mother rather than collecting dust in the Smithsonian. And over time, you know, they worked out the details, and they did. And they brought him here to Geneva Cemetery. His mother is buried, and if you look back in the distance there, see that group of oak trees? His mother is buried there. That is where they buried his skull. 
his headstone is this right here. So, there you have it. The story of Lewis Powell's skull. Now, like I said, history is all around. Sometimes you got to look for it. Sometimes you find it. But it's there. Now, if you like this video, you have any questions, go ahead and leave a comment. Go ahead and hit like. And please, subscribe. Okay? So, for Virtual History 360, I'm Mr. Wade. Thank you.